word. Hosea, if you will, chapter number 7 in our Old Testament. Hosea, chapter number 7, please, as we're standing for the reading of, the, of God's word. And uh, boy, we're excited to have everybody here this evening. What a great crowd we had Sunday morning. Number of guests, both in Sunday school and church. Let me encourage you, while the word of God is open and being taught, Let's give the best, our full attention to what the Lord has for us this evening. In Hosea chapter 7, how many of you are a little on the warm side in here? How many of you, it's a little bit toasty. It is a little warm to me. Anyone else, you're a little warm. Are you good out there? No other hands went up. Anybody else a touch? How many of you are a little cool? A little cool? Okay, I think we're doing all right then. We'll leave it as is. Hosea chapter number 7. Hosea chapter number 7. I'd like to speak tonight on flip your flapjacks. Flip. Your flapjacks. That's the title of the sermon tonight. As you look in your Bible there and you try to find where I get that, pa- that title from, look at Hosea chapter 7, please, in verse number 1. And I'll read the scripture for us. The Bible says this, When I would have healed Israel, the Lord is speaking through Hosea, Then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered in the wickedness of Samaria. For they committed falsehood, and thief cometh in, and the troop of the robbers spoileth without. They considered not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers as an oven heated by the baker who ceases from raising after, from raising after he hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretcheth out his hand with scorners. For they have made ready their heart like a, an oven, whilst they lie in wait. Their baker sleepeth all the night, and the morning it burneth as a flaming fire. They are all hot as an oven, and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth upon me. Let's stop verse number 8, please. It says, Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. And where we get the title for tonight, Ephraim is a cake not turned. We're going to pray before we do. Flapjacks. I've got a a skillet with me here. I've got a a frying pan. I've got a flapjack and I've got a spatula. You pour the mix onto the griddle and then you wait for the bottom to get golden brown. And then what do you do? Boys and girls, what do you do once the pancake gets golden brown on the bottom? You flip the flapjack over. You flip over your pancake. Can you see that right there? What do you do once it gets nice and brown on the bottom? What do you do? You flip your flapjack. Can you say that? You flip your flapjack. That's what you do. What happens if you don't flip your pancake over when it's done? What happens if you leave it? What happens? One side gets burnt and the other side stays cold. The one side gets too hot and the other side stays too cold if we don't flip over our flapjacks. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray the truth tonight would be a blessing. Lord, help us to teach the word aright. Help us to, uh, Lord, remember those things we should say. Holy Spirit, please guide the thoughts. Guide me. Guide us. We pray these things, Lord, in Christ's name. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray again. Amen. Be seated if you would, please. I would like for us to flip open Hosea 7 first before we get to our flapjacks tonight. Let me start with the man who wrote the book. God used the prophet Hosea. I'll give you some timeline in order for us to get to verse number 8. Let me explain, and I think we're already on here, aren't we, gentlemen? Around 750 B.C., that was the ministry of Hosea, around 750 Hosea is is setting up his ministry, and he goes and sets up his ministry in the capital city of Israel, the northern kingdom. Judah is the southern kingdom, and the capital city is Samaria. The king of Samaria was made made Israel, the city of Samaria was made the capital of Israel under a king called King Omri, O-M-R-I, in 880 B.C. He changed the name to Samaria from what it was before. Here's what happened. Omri wanted to, uh, oh, but before I get there, Omri was Ahab's father, and we know that both Ahab and Omri did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. 
After Omri died and was buried in Samaria, Ahab then took the throne. That's 874. And he and his wife, Jezebel, uh, in the next 22 years that he was king, built quite a uh, place there in Samaria on the top of the hill. This included a large temple that was built to Jezebel's god, two of her gods that she brought with her and the religion that she brought with her. There was a temple built there. There was an altar that Ahab built for Jezebel up there to the god Baal and Asherah as well. There were so many evil kings in the northern kingdom in those ten tribes during this 200-year period. It was just amazing uh, the, how, how evil the kings were. It started in 931 with Jeroboam, and we know the kingdom was divided and we know about that. Jeroboam in 931 erected golden calves, and he said to all the people of Israel, he said, Behold thy gods, O Israel. And then we find as we read through all the kings from 931 all the way until Assyria comes in and takes over the land of Israel, we find that many of the kings got assassinated. In fact, one king got assassinated by another one who pronounced himself to be king, who was then assassinated by somebody else who took the throne, and it was just a, an ongoing thing. Jeroboam, his son Nabad, followed him in 910, and then he was killed by Basha in 909, and Basha made himself the king and killed everybody that was left behind of Jer Jeroboam's family. He wanted to make sure that nobody from Jeroboam's descendants could take the throne and, uh, and usurp the throne from him. Then Elah came after that in 886, and he assassinated Basha and ruled for two years, but he got drunk, and in his drunkard, in his drunkard stupor, uh, he was assassinated by a man named Zimri. Zimri decided, I'm going to be the king now, and I took down the other guy. And so now for one week, he uh, straddled the throne, but the people of Israel said, no, Zimri, you're not going to be the king. We're making Omri the king. And so they chased after Zimri, chased him off the throne. They chased him to, I'm sorry, they chased him to the king's house. And, and, and there, as he was surrounded in the king's house, Zimri sets fire to the king's house, and the king's house burned to the ground or burns down upon him, and he takes his own life. We see that's the story of him. What a mess. Omri, the people's choice, ended up being one of the most evil kings of all of them. And then wicked King Ahab and his idolatrous wife Jezebel. After Ahab and Jezebel, we find that 12 more kings reigned then, and these were also evil kings. Finally, in 732, we see Samaria comes in, and we see in 721 the destruction of Samaria. That's from 931. Think about this. From 931 until 721 is 210 years where God saw the evil and the wickedness of the people of Israel, and yet he was patient for 210 years. Talk about the patience and the grace of God. Talk about the mercy of God upon the people there. And he put up with their iniquities for all of that time. And finally he said, enough is enough. That's it. And God's patience ran out. Those who have visited, I don't know if anyone here has visited Samaria before, the old uh, ancient city of Samaria, but those who have visited or studied the city, they know this. When Omri decided to build a capital city for the nation of Israel, for his kingdom, he bought a piece of land. It was a hill. And he bought that land in 879 B.C. And on top of that hill, he built the city of Samaria. He built that city. The city of Samaria was named after the man he bought the land from. And in the English, it's the word Samaria. Omri built the palace on the very top of the hill where he built the city. On the very top. And still, these right now today, you could go to the old remains of Samaria and you could find the steps that Omri built that lead all the way up to the palace. You can find the remains, some of the remains of the palace still there. You can still find some of the remains of the wall that Omri built around the palace and the wall that was added on top of the wall that Omri built that was added on it by Ahab. And this is, these are the remains that 3,000 years ago were built. All the kings of Israel, after the palace was built, all of them ruled from on top of this hill and they, when they, until Assyria occupied the land in 732 B.C. and then destroyed the city in 721. I, this is an amazing thing I found out about Samaria. Archaeologists found that in their dig and in their searching through the palace and through that whole area on top of the the hill of Samaria, they found ivory. They found remains of ivory statues, remains of ivory furniture, remains of ivory jewels, ivory being imported. You didn't, they didn't have it there. The most expensive of the most expensive of the most uh, wealthy 
could import ivory. And you're finding here the wickedness and the corruption of these kings, these evil kings for 200 and some odd years of the nation of Israel, how that they taxed the people and took from the people and then kept it to themselves and made themselves wealthy and lined their pockets. It's just like America has only been a few hundred years ago. And here we are doing the same thing. Corrupt kings, corrupt people lining their pockets, lining uh, and, uh, and uh, in secret, hiding and keeping hidden sins. And we find that nothing has changed even in our land today and here these crooked uh, these crooked kings uh, performed uh, their their uh, their usury upon the people and took advantage of the people and made themselves great and wealthy at the expense of the people instead of helping the people instead of helping them Ahab chose very poorly for a wife we know he chose Jezebel who was Jezebel the daughter of who the king of Sidon Sidon Tyre and Sidon right on the coast the eastern coast of, of the Mediterranean there. She, when he married her and she came up to the top of the hill, when she came up to the top to the palace to live with Ahab in the palace on the top of the hill there of Samaria, she brought with her her paganism. She, she brought with her her prophets of Baal and her prophets of Asheroth. See, Baal is the prophet of nature. To them, it was the, the, I mean, the, the God, I should say, the God of nature, Baal was. The God of the sky, the God of the wind, the God of the clouds, the God of the rain, the God of nature. Asherah was another God that she worshipped, and Asherah was a God of fertility. And she gets there, and now they're married, and she begins putting pressure on Ahab to turn him to adopt her gods, and then also to turn the country to do the same thing. The remains of the temple and the altar that were built by Ahab for her are still there. Some of the remains are still there. And it's amazing when you see it, the temple is still, you can tell that it was facing east. Why is that insignificant? Because pagan, they would worship their pagan gods facing east east. They would pray, and it was a natural thing for them to do that, to pray for good fortune, to pray for growth. And that was, you can even see there, the remains of the temple. The people of Israel understand why did they turn to these false gods? Why were they so easily deceived to do so? They were simply very simple shepherds, many of them. They were very ignorant farmers. That's what they did. They were simple shepherds. They were simple farmers. And they wanted and needed rain from the sky. They wanted good soil because they needed good grain. They needed fertile soil. And so the people come to Samaria. They can't wait to see their king. They go up the steps. They go up to the end of the Samaria, to the top of the hill. They go up to the palace. They get to see their king's palace. They get to see where their king lives. They get to see the temple that was built for, uh, for, uh, for Jezebel. They, they see the altar there. And then every generation after that, until 721 or 732, I should say. And they see the burnt offerings to these two gods. And they would probably, and they did, ask the question, why are you praying to these gods? Why, what do you need help from these gods for? What's the purpose of, of these, this temple? What is the purpose of this altar here? Well, and, the, and their response would be, uh, we're praying for rain for you because you're farmers. We're praying for rain and fertile soil for you. We're praying for you to have what you need. We're praying for the people to provide so that your needs are met. And the people were easily deceived into turning their backs on the one true and living God of Israel. And we find that Jezebel was able to institute, with her influence, able to institute a worship of Baal and Asherah throughout the whole country of Israel. This is all the backdrop to get to verse number 8 of chapter 7 in Hosea. God's prophet, we know, it's about 20 miles away from the top of that hill where that palace was, about 20 miles to the west and north. Before, Right before you get to the Mediterranean Sea, you can look it up just south of Tyre, just not too far from Sidon, where Jezebel was from, is where we find Elijah in the same mountain range, the mountains of Samaria, on Mount Carmel, slaying all of Jezebel's prophets to these two false gods. And we see from the king's palace, picture this if you will. This helps you understand this, uh, what, what Hosea is trying to tell us. From the king's palace, at the top of the hill of Samaria, nothing obstructed the king from seeing everything that he ruled over. From to the west, he saw the beauty of the Mediterranean Sea, 25 miles away. From the, to the east, he could see the Jordan River Valley, 25 miles to the east. 
40 miles to the south was Jerusalem, and 30 miles to the north was Megiddo and the Jezreel Valley. I mean, the location to rule from, he was able, as the king of Israel, to look down upon the kingdom that he ruled from in every direction and look down upon his subject that were to worship him or to follow him and to, to follow him as he ruled over them. And today, that location is desolate. That hill is desolate. That palace is desolate. That city today, the old ancient ancient city of Samaria has been laid waste by the hand of God. And so we go back to Hosea, and 20 years before the Assyrians come in and invade and take over the land of Israel, Hosea is preaching. And Hosea is preaching against the sins of the people. Look at chapter 7, please, and verse number 1 with me, if you would. And under these 19 kings, from Jeroboam to Hoshea, before the invasion, or, and then it's right at the back end of Ho- Hoshea and the one other king before him, his reign, Hosea's message when he's alive around 750, his message is this. He just says this. He says to the people, repent. Turn to God. Turn back toward God. And in Hosea 7 and verse number 10, 1, it says, if you'll look there with me, please, God would have healed Israel. He would have healed them. He would have healed Israel. But notice something happened. If you look at verse number 1 again, if you will, with me, notice Israel had secret sins. The iniquity of Ephraim or Israel was discovered. Notice the word discovered and the wickedness of Samaria is mentioned there. So instead, we find here that God wanted to heal them. He wanted to heal the people, but instead of being able to heal the people, we find that their sin was discovered. And I studied this and I looked it up, and here's what it means. Their secret sins that were covered up and hidden were now out in the open. Now their sins were out in the open. In other words, they flaunted them publicly before God's face. They flaunted them their sins publicly before all of the people and everyone and everything. Let me explain. It's one thing to sin in secret, and that's bad enough. But you sink as low as you can go by bringing your sin out in the open and not apologizing for it. I mean, that's when you seek as low... Let me give you an example is the homosexuals. And God says a whole lot about that in the Bible. A few decades ago in our country, they lived in secret. They lived undercover. They concealed their sin. And you know that and I know that. If you know anything about the history of our country over the last many decades, now they're very open about what God calls perversion. Now they're very open about it. Now they're very open and demand to be accepted and demand to be protected and demand. Now it's discovered. Now it's uncovered. Now it's open all across America. And by the tens of thousands, they are speaking out and roaring loudly to be accepted as normal, normal is what they're asking for and pleading for and demanding. Once what was done in secret now has been brought out in the open. They have their own flag that they wave. They have their own month to celebrate the perversion that they participate in against an almighty God. They have their days of pride. Today, June 15th, is Columbus, Ohio Pride Day. This Saturday is Pride Day at Great America in Santa Clara, California. Next Saturday is Nashville, Tennessee Pride Day at Capitol Mall State Park. Next week is Latin American Pride Day in Mexico City. Kenny Chesney is putting on a gay rights event in Chicago later this month. Last Sunday was the Disneyland Los Angeles Pride Parade. Disney down in Florida. Disney calls them their gay days at Orlando's Disney World. A quote, 50,000 red-shirted gay days attendees pack Walt Disney World's original park, end quote. Those aren't my words or your words. Those are their words from their DisneyWorldGayDays.com website and their articles, not ours. Someone might say, Pastor, sin is sin. Sin is sin. Someone might say, people sinned 100 years ago just like they sin today. Listen very carefully. Yes, they did 100 years ago sin like they did today. But wait a minute. What's the difference? What's the difference, you ask? What's the difference, I ask tonight? 100 years ago, these sins were undercover in mass, done in secret, kept hidden. Why? Because there was still shame connected with these sins. There is still shame in America for the sins and the perversions that God makes very clear in the Word of God that we're not to act out in our land. There was, was still shame connected with these sins. And today, sin is out in the open. Today, the most abominable sins that God writes about in the Bible and gives us are flying 
flaunted in front of the whole world and in front of the face of God as a new morality, if you will. And we put a little bubble or halo of protection they're asking for around these sins. Today, sinners are now applauded and courageous and brave and daring. I remember years ago when ESPN and the SB Awards made a huge deal of Bruce Jenner. And it's applauded and it's praised. And don't you dare be a bigot and say anything different. Living with someone we're not married to is now done openly and praised as being honest and courageous instead of being a shameful thing before Almighty God. I tell folks, go ahead, call us a square. This Bible is just about square. You know, being a square keeps us from going around and around and around in circles as the world goes around and around and around and around without God, without God, without God. If you would hear this, please, this evening, God's Word has not changed and never will change. God's Word has not changed and never will change. It never will. America's openness with their sin is not a sign of advancing forward. It's not a sign of improvement. And, uh, and what's the word and the term that they use of being, uh, uh, being more... Uh, I can't, some, of those ter- that, some of that terminology they use where we in- inclusion and the rest of it. But instead, it is an indication, instead of inclusion, that we're losing our civilization. That's what it's selling us. That's exactly what... We're losing it. Mark it down. Truth. We're losing our civilization. We're losing Christianity and God-fearing cultures. Losing any semblance of it. Let's move on, if we could, please, at verse number 2. Notice verse number 2. Verse number 2, it says, And they considered not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. God is reminding us, of course, here that God, God's eyes are all seeing. God sees everything, and His mind is eternal. And yet, even though God's mind is eternal and God's eyes see everything, we see here, yet Israel, the people of Israel, they think that God, for some reason, they think that God doesn't remember, that God doesn't notice, that God is forgetful. This, uh, they, the same thing was said in Psalm 94 and verse number 7, yet they say the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. God's not paying attention. And here we find the people of the nation of Israel, they've deceived themselves. Their own doings have set them about, Hosea says. They're now at the lowest depths of morality that they could go, and their sins have now surrounded them on every side. Their friends and neighbors, they see the sin openly, yet they don't believe that God does. They don't believe that God sees it. It's like the captain of the Titanic who refused to believe that the ship was in trouble until the water was ankle deep in the room that he was in. Only then did he see that the unsinkable was going to sink. And because he refused to see what was going on, other ships were not called on in time to rescue them until it was too late. Go to verse number 3, if you would, please. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. Here we see the evil kings. What an amazing statement to make about a a group of people in a nation that the kings are rejoicing and they're loving the fact that they have changed the hearts and the lives and the living and the actions and the deeds of the people that that they are to serve. They have turned the hearts and turned the lives of the people that are their subjects, and now these evil kings are loving the fact that the people are wicked. They're loving the fact that people are profane, and people were conforming to the king's ways and the king's teachings and the king's influence and the king's gods. We're talking about blasphemous, we're talking about foul-mouthed, vulgar kings that are leading over the people. And my, let me just say this, a foul mouth, uh, people with a foul mouth doesn't make them more of a, more of a man or more grown up. They just lack a good vocabulary. They just lack the ability to express themselves in a proper and a decent manner. That's all. That's what that is. Israel was full of lies, full of vulgarity, full of wickedness, and the kings and princes ate it up. They loved it. Keep reading with me, if you would, please, in verse number 4. They, this talking about the people, are all, all adulterers as an oven heated by the baker. Hosea says here, and this is interesting, he likes to use these different uh, illustrations. He likes to use uh, things from the house, things that are maybe homey or homely or that are relatable. And he says, talking about the baker, And the people, he says, are like an oven. The people of Israel are like an oven that's too hot for the baker to use. Notice if you look there in verse number uh, uh, number four, he says the adultery, 
the uncleanness. Go to verse number eight, 6, if you will, please. What does it say in verse number 6? For they have made ready their heart like an oven. Verse 7, please. They are all hot as an oven. Hosea is saying this. Let me, As I studied this out, the, Hosea is saying that the people of Israel have been influenced by their kings in such a way that the kings have stirred up the passions. They've stirred up the lust. They've stirred up the lust for immorality and for all of this sin. And they've stirred it up in the hearts of the people and now the, 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 the lust in the hearts of the people is way too hot for the baker to be able to do his work stirred like a baker stirs up a fire who ceaseth not from raising it up the people were like an oven when it is at its hottest fiery hot are the lusts of an unclean heart in Job chapter 24 and verse number 15 the Bible says the eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight saying no eye shall see me and disguiseth his face. We're trying to get an idea or a picture of what these people were like and what, how they lived their life. And these people were adulterers and fornicators, secretly burning in lust like an oven that is too hot and needs to be cooled before the baker can cook his bread. Lust in the heart, Hosea is teaching us, is like fire in an oven. Notice Hosea says this next. If you would, look with me to verse number 5. He says, The king has become an alcoholic. The king has become a drunkard. Notice, if you will, the middle, middle part of the verse in verse 5. It, uh, Hosea says, sick with bottles of wine. The princes have made him sick. He's making a fool of himself. The northern kingdom is about to fall because they've turned away from God. But who com what comes and what comes upon a people when they turn from God? Two things that always come. Mark it down. It always comes. It always comes when people turn away from God in a society, in a land, in a nation. Gross immorality comes and strong drink comes every single time. Sauce and sex and the bottle and the brothel and wine and women. Mark it down. It just does. This is what occupied the people's minds. This is what occupied their heart. This is what occupied their time there in the northern kingdom. And it was unashamed. They were unabashed. It was out in the open. Again, we look to verse number 6. And it says, whilst they lie in wait. What does that mean? It means this. They would burn in lust just waiting for the next opportunity to fulfill their wicked desires. They would notice the end of verse number 6. Their baker sleepeth all the night and in the morning it burneth as a flaming fire. So here the baker, he puts lots of fuel into the oven. Then the baker goes off to bed. Then he goes to sleep. He sleeps all night. And then in the morning, the baker rises up and he goes to the oven and he finds there in the oven that the oven is still well heated. And that was the wicked people of the nation of Israel they make their wicked plans and to gratify the unclean lust that they had and they'll, they're fully set and ready to act upon that which is in their heart and burning and burning too hot and sometimes things will prevent them to be able to act on it for a little while and then the fire of their corrupt affections is still glowing within their hearts and as soon as the opportunity presents itself, they break out into action and they give themselves over to that wickedness, that sin. Something else, notice verse number 7, if you would, and have devoured their judges. Here we see Israel had some good judges left. Within the land, they had some good judges. These judges tried to put out the fiery flame inside the heart, the lustful flame inside the hearts of the people. The judges would try to step, out, step up with the Word of God and with good judgment and justice and try to put those fires out from among the people. But these good judges were devoured. I believe most likely they were stoned to death. They, they were taken out of the way. Then notice again in verse number 7, all their kings are fallen. Wow. There is none among them that calleth upon me or unto me. Not one good king in the northern kingdom. Not one. Go back all the way to Jeroboam and then all the way to Hoshea. All the way till Assyria comes in. Check every one. Now some good kings in the southern kingdom, what's the, what's the southern kingdom called? Help me, the southern kingdom is what? Judah. And Judah, what, the line of Judah, who, who is to come from the line of Judah? The line of the tribe of Judah, who is that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So of course, God wasn't. God didn't promise a blessing to the northern kingdom when it was divided. God's blessing still remained with in Jer Jerusalem there, in Judah to the south. And we see that the line of Judah, that God's blessing was there, and God's promise was there to bless David's line. Not the, 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 uh, the, 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 not the divided ten tribes to the north, and all evil kings in the north, every one of them, assassinations, bloodshed, kings, falling with their sword upon kings to take their throne and take their power. Jeroboam's whole line being murdered. I mean, talk about cursed. A cursed people for 210 years and nobody, not one king has called upon the Lord. That gives us the history that brings us to verse number 8, tonight's truth. Look at the verse again with me, verse 8. Ephraim, again, this is talking about as a whole, the nation of Israel. And then you get the word Samaria in verse number one is talking about not only the nation of Israel, but also specifically the city of Samaria. So Ephraim, again, this is the nation of Israel. He hath mixed himself among the people. Don't forget that phrase. Verse number eight, when we get down to flipping our flapjacks, God's talking about flipping our flapjacks. He's talking about mixing. God's people mixing with the heathen people. God's, it's about the mixture that God saw there. And that's where he comes up with this. God gave Hosea this illustration about a cake. Notice Ephraim is a cake, not turn. If you look at this verse, we know number one. We know number one that God is against mixture. Listen very carefully, please. And I'm only going to say a few words and then we'll go on to the last thought for tonight. We know that God is against mixture. We know that God wants his children to stay in their own crowd to stay in their own peculiar people see God wants a peculiar people not a polluted people I said God wants a peculiar people not a polluted people for himself he says no mixing with the world no mingling no associating with the world uh, you are to distinguish yourself as different you're to distinguish yourself as peculiar and different. But the opposite, as we're learning and understanding these people, that's the opposite of what they were doing. The people were conforming to the heathen. The people were joining up with and associating and, associating and becoming what the heathen were. They lost their identity as a child of God. They mingled with the heathen and learned their works, serving their idols, sacrificed their sons and daughters unto devils, became polluted, defiled. That's the words, the reminder from the words of David in the Psalms, chapter 106, verse 35 and 30 through 39 there. The last phrase, though, what did God say? He hath mixed himself among the people. He being the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. And he ends the verse, a continuation of the thought, and the first part is the last part of the verse. They are a cake not turned. They are a cake not turned. What does that mean? When you make a pancake, what do you do first? Maybe you put something on the uh, stove. Maybe you put something on your griddle. You pour in a fourth or maybe a half cup, whatever size pancake you're looking for, into of cake batter onto the pan, onto the griddle, onto the stove. The pan, or in their day, in Hosea 7, it was an oven, and it's heated already. It's ready to go. The batter then naturally spreads across that surface. After about two minutes, depending on the temperature, you take your utensil, you take your device, and before you use it, you check to see if one side is done cooking. One side, cooks, bakers, those who are expert in the kitchen, please don't crucify me tonight. Please. You look for air pockets forming at the top. You look for edges being formed around the outside. Then what do you do? Once you believe and it looks like all the signs say that it's ready, you do what? You flip your flapjack over. So the other side can cook. The people of Israel were supposed to be flipped over like a flapjack. They were supposed to be flipped over. Hosea loved to use these common domestic illustrations, and he says, the heart is like an oven, and adulterers are like an overheated oven, and a whole nation, the whole nation here is like an unflipped pancake, a cake not turned over. In that day, the people would cook their food on the top of a stove. They would make little cakes, like our pancakes, actually. 
They would make little cakes. And even today, in some places in Israel, they still use the same process on the same type stoves, the same type pancakes or cakes. So here's the question for us tonight. What happens? What happens if we don't flip our flapjacks? If a cake is not turned, what happens? One side gets burnt. Here's the truth. One side gets burnt. The other side stays raw. One side has too much heat. The other side is cold. And it isn't cooked through. What does that mean, we asked Hosea? What does that mean for us tonight? Both sides, for a flapjack, for a pancake, for a cake not turned, both sides are no good to the baker. Both sides are no good to the Heavenly Father. One side is burnt, one side is cold, and that was the spiritual condition of the people of Israel, the people in Ephraim. A perfect example, quickly turn there with me, and we'll look at one other chapter, and then come back, if you will, to Hosea 7. Go to 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm going to look at one, just one passage. 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm going to read it right when I get there. 1 Kings 18. You know the story of Ahab. You know the story of, uh, of Elijah. In 1 Kings 18, verse 17, the Bible says this, 1 Kings 18, 17, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, here he's talking to the, the mighty prophet of God, the mighty prophet Elijah, and Ahab, the wicked, wicked, evil king, says to Elijah, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And Elijah, what's his answer back? I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam, or Baal, the god Baal. Now therefore, Elijah says, Send and gather to me all Israel, Unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. And so Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And notice verse 21, it says, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. What did the people do? What did the people say? And the people answered him not a word. Why halt ye? Here it is. Here's our answer from Hosea. Oh, about this thing of what happens if we don't flip our pancake over. If you and I are resembling that flapjack, resembling that cake. If our cake is not turned. What happens? Here's our answer. They were overcooked for Baal. They were scalding hot for Baal and cold toward God. They were straddling, notice it says halt. They were straddling the fence. They answered him not a word. They were halted. That word halted between two opinions. It means they were skipping between two opinions. They were dancing back and forth, dancing one minute. Jehovah is my God. I follow him. The next minute, follow Balaam. I serve Balaam. I worship Balaam. And what a great illustration that Hosea chooses to use here. Cold on one side and on the other burnt. Cold on one side and on the other side burnt because the cake wasn't turned over. Sometimes they seemed like they were zealous for God. Other times they were hot for Baal and cold toward God. Sometimes they professed to be a Christian. They professed to be a believer. And other times, like a cake not turned, they lived at the complete other extreme. Here's the application for us. Two opposite extremes as far as you can get. Burnt to a crisp and cold and raw on top. You can't get to farther ends of the spectrum. And this was the people. With one crowd, the people of Israel would run hot for God, it seemed like. But with another crowd, they would run cold for God. I mean, the two extremes of the flapjack, unflipped. Top side, uncooked. Top side, cold. Underside, overcooked. Underside, burnt. Both sides, no good. As I apply the truth and we'll be done for tonight. Is that our Christianity? I'd like us all to ask ourselves the question, are we one way around Christians and another way around our other crowd that we run with? 
Do we have two different crowds that we run with? Do we have two different ways that we live? Are we trying to be two different people depending on who we are around? Are we being pulled in two different directions? Maybe you find yourself like the Israelite tonight. They pretended to love God at times, but the other crowd was really, truly, the other crowd was really, truly the real crowd that they burned hot with. The crowd that they really burned hot with wasn't really the crowd of God. It was really the other crowd that they had. Is our Christianity possibly somewhat counterfeit? A young Chinese man wanted to learn, a young man wanted to learn about one particular gem, a jade. He searched out and found an older man, an older, wise, gentle teacher to teach him about this gem. And the first thing they did in their first session, the one-hour session, is the, the gentle teacher put the, 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 the precious stone into his hand. He said, I want you to grip it as tight as you can. Just hold it in your hand nice and tight. As the student held it for an hour, the teacher began to talk about everything else. Everything else under the sun except about the, what he came to learn. He wanted to learn about the jade. He wanted to learn about the gem. And then he sent him home after the hour was up. He was done talking about this and that and family and everything else. He sent him home. That was his session. And this came this went day after day after week after week. I mean, it went on for weeks. The boy, the young man became very frustrated. He wanted to learn about this precious stone, but he was too respectful of the wisdom of the old elderly teacher. Then one day, to start the session, the wise old man, as he did each time, he put another stone in the hands of the young man. The young man knew right away that the, the jade was a very dense stone. The jade was a heavy. He could throw it up and catch it, and he could tell that it was dense. It was heavier than other stones, other gems. Immediately when it went into his hand, he shouted, this isn't Jade, this isn't jade, this isn't jade. I know it's after weeks of handling the real thing, he knew it was counterfeit. He knew it wasn't jade. He knew it wasn't the stone that he was supposed to be learning about. And I'm done. Here's this last thought. I believe all of us, everyone here, we have already, all of us, been around real Christians, real believers Real Christians who have made the Lord their God and are following God. And so you can answer this question for yourself and I can answer this question for myself. Am I counterfeit? Am I living a double life? Am I hot or cold for God depending on where I am? Am I hot or cold for God Depending on whom I'm with. Am I stuck? Am I halted between two different lives? Am I trapped? Do I feel trapped, if you will? As one side, the sinful flesh is being overcooked and burned, and the other side remains uncooked. Little, if any, real relationship with the Lord like you could have or like I could have. Am I like Ephraim, a cake not turned? Burnt, cold. Two very drastic extremes. Final question. I asked myself this question, and I ask you to ask yourself privately this question. When off church property, do I run cold toward God? Or do I run hot? When off God's property, when off the church property, when not here at New Hope, do I run cold or do I run hot? Ver read verse number 8 with me again, please. Notice what it says at the top of the verse. The verse is about mixture. Mixture with the people like a cake not turned toward God. Like a cake that's not turned Toward God. Flip your flapjack. Do you have two crowds you run with? Do you have two groups? Are you halted between two opinions? Would you say in your own heart, would you acknowledge in your own heart if there's some counterfeit there? 
Some counterfeit there. Not a cake. Not turned. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth tonight. It does not matter that the truth went forth, Lord. It does not matter. It doesn't matter that the truth went forth. Lord, what matters is what am I going to do with it? Lord, I know that that's what matters. What matters is what am I going to do? We already know that your word doesn't return void, but what am I going to choose to do with the truth of the word of God? What am I going to do with the words from the prophet Hosea? What will I do about it? Lord, help me, please.